Revive Church. Woo, sorry. <laughs> How are you this morning? <laughs> now you're awake. Oh, we are going to worship the Lord because I have to tell you, I am really happy to be back in this house with you this morning. So would you please stand up and sing with us? The Holy Spirit, God breathes down. Watch the waters. Pod before us now. Come and see. to uh, welcome you to Revive. Thank you for abiding by the rules, wearing your mask while you're inside. Um, we will only be unmasked, one of us on stage at a time. So please and thank you for abiding by the restrictions, but really thank you for just being here this morning. Amen. So I'm going to, we're going to watch a video about a great serve opportunity next weekend. I hope that you will get involved. Focus, we've got to focus, I'll be right back. He's a good leave it. Are you there? Okay, we gotta make this quick. We don't have much time. I love working out. It's morning time and I'm exercising. Did you get your exercising today? Okay, I got, I got something to say because Haley told me I have to focus and get out the message that we have been told to deliver on high. 
So we are back this time for Revive Church. You know, my peeps in Northwest Independence would like to bring new life to the neighborhood. Whoa! No, I'm serious though. Okay, but this time we really need your help. We still need 20, two zero volunteers to help this Saturday, August 22nd, from 7 a.m. the crack of dawn to 12. I mean, you don't have to work that whole time, 7 a.m. to 12 noon. Sign up to work in shifts to help lift boxes of produce and non-perishable food items into automobiles. You know, we have been working with CSL since the Rona came to help feed families and neighborhoods and children. But it's really important. We need 20 volunteers to sign up, 7 a.m. to 12 noon, pick a shift. Hey, and you can bring the kids, hold on, hold on. If they know how to lift boxes, like, <laughs> we're gonna be doing all that. We're gonna lift boxes. There's nothing in this box. 7 a.m. to 12 noon. Sign up in shifts. If you want to sign up, you can sign up on our Facebook page at the Revive Church Facebook page. Remember I told you last week, I don't know how that works. Just go search for Revive Church and Independence. That's us. Or you can email staff at gorevivechurch.com. If I was fancy, it would have been like this on the screen, but we don't have the technology. I'm using my iPhone. Okay, I got to wrap this up because it's way long. It's way long. Cartel would say this video is way long. Did you get the deets? This Saturday, August 22nd, we need 20 volunteers to lift boxes of fresh produce, non-perishable food items into vehicles for our families who could use and benefit. Just an extra source of goodness. So, oh, location. You gotta know where we going. CSL, the Nolan Road in Truman location. Remember, 7 a.m. to noon, you can sign up in shifts. If you wanna sign up, you can email staff at GoRevivechurch.com or you can check out our Facebook page, Bring the Kids, Bring the Boxes, and we can help out our families in need. That was awesome, right? Let's give it up for Meredith, please. <clears throat> I forgot to take this guy down. Sorry for that. He has nothing to do with the message today. It's a grasshopper. You guys know that from Karate Kid? No? Okay. Now, I need to get a baseline from you guys, so I can't tell if you're smiling or not. So everybody smile real quick so I can learn to read your eyes if you're smiling. You guys are smiling? It looks the exact same. I'm, so we're <laughs> I'm in big trouble. Um, we do have that serve opportunity coming up this Saturday. Make sure you sign up on Facebook.com um, or if you just want us to pick a spot for you, send it to staff at Um We need some extra volunteers. If you have any questions, just ask me afterwards. Um, welcome, guys, in person. This is awesome, right? This feels good. Thank you. Um, we are trying to, we're going to record this. So Last service, we tried to stream, and it didn't work um, for us, so we had a studio audience. It was, it was awesome, but this service is just like regular, so good to have you. Good to be here. Um, I got so many jokes that I can't use today because I got to stay focused, so you'll get a few, all right? Rookie, just a few. Huzzah! Huzzah! <laughs> that was part of our kids' VBS. All right, I'm going to get right into it. Um, so... We're kicking off a series, a three-week series. We're going to go through seven different things that are our for sures, the seven for sures of Revive, the non-negotiables. So I want you guys to think about in, in your life, if you're a Christian or a non-Christian or nominal or checking us out or whatever it is, or online kind of just scrolling through and you happened upon Revive Church, to think through what are the non-negotiables in your life, in your family. You could even go into your, your job, into generations behind you, like the things that are settled, right? Not up for discussion. That's what we're going to be talking about today. This is going to really help. Somebody's at the door. Cody, if you could go grab that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is a family here at Revive. Um, okay, so the seven for sure is of Revive. I'm going to jump um, into it, but before we get there, we're going to do a little pre-training exercise. Nobody needs to go get the door. I was just teasing. Oh, no, it's good. A little pre-training exercise, warming up, all right? So here's the line. Um, Jesus brings new life, we participate. Could you say that with me? Jesus brings new life, we participate. It's incredibly important to understand that as we go out and do Jesus' work in the neighborhood that we just settle in 
that he brings the new life. That comes from John 11, uh, the story of Jesus bringing Lazarus, his really good, if not best friend, back to life. And we noticed Lazarus had been dead. Four days, Jesus says, come out after he prays to God. Lazarus comes walking out clearly alive. Everybody is in awe. And then he tells his followers, go and take his grave clothes off. He's saying you, as followers of Jesus, have a participation piece to remind people of their freedom. But Jesus is the one who actually brings new life. So he has the power, not us. We simply follow him. In that section in John 11, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He promises that no matter what you're going through, it will not end in death. Now, he's talking about spiritual death, and he's using physical death as an analogy here in the life of Lazarus. But really what he's talking about, no matter what you go through, heaven is on the other side, eternity with God. Man, that beautiful inheritance that we have is important. Keep that in mind as we go through these essentials. Let's pray. Um, God, thanks for this opportunity. Um, It is so good in the midst of so many crazy things going on that we can settle in and stand on the rock, which is Christ, and know that, man, you are solid. We might waver, but when we come back to you, we always hear one clear message. And today I pray that that would be really loud. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, we're going to go through two today of the seven for sure. The first one is got to go. Got to go. Matthew 16, 24 says this, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple, so he's saying if you want to be the real deal, my true disciple, you must deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life, and this is really important, for me, not just loses their life, right? For me will find it. And then it goes even deeper and more helpful. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, pursuing all the things that the world has, but to lose their very soul? Whew. Thank you so much, Jesus, for this teaching. So let's talk about this. Let's be real. The going part is easy. It's the leaving that's hard. My sister and her husband just moved from New York to Boulder, Colorado. They drove across the nation, very crazy, with a U-Haul on the back of their SUV. Um, Leaving New York was hard for them. Now, it's not the New York that they love. (laughs) It may never be the same um, because it got hit like harder than any place in in the country. But leaving was hard um, because they're leaving friends and family and the life and jobs that they knew. But the going part, man, that's kind of exciting, this adventure on the other side. Now, when we think about our spiritual life and we think going and stepping into Jesus all the way and saying, man, I want the life that God has for me. That's exciting, right? But then the next thought is usually, what do I have to leave behind? Well, that's where it gets tricky. The things that mean a lot to you, right? The stuff you used to do, the habits, the comforts, the go-tos when things get hard. Um, We said this last service that some of us, I mean, me included, over the last five months, there's some bad habits that we picked up on in this coronavirus quarantine time, right, that we're going to have to break. That's going to be tough. Our self-image can be affected. Addictions can start to resurge and on and on. It's hard to leave those things. And Jesus says, deny yourself. Basically, he's saying, starve that craving. That's hard. I know. Really hard. He says, don't give you what you want. But in this, you will find the life God has for you. If you deny yourself, God shows up. He promises that he will fill your life with something so much better. So let's go back to this gotta go idea. Nothing happens unless somebody goes, right? Like if we all sat in here and says, man, I'm I'm hungry. I'm hungry. And nobody was willing to go get us something to eat. We just stay hungry, right? But if Brandon got up and went and got us some Wendy's and came back, then we'd be feeling better about ourselves, right? Nothing happens unless somebody goes. Same thing with the Jesus movement. When we track the beginning of when Jesus declared the Great Commission moving forward into the book of Acts, like how did this Jesus movement spread across the world, we find something incredibly important that it was always on the backs. Significant gospel movement, and we'll talk about that here in just a second, was on the backs of regular folks. Raise your hand if you're a regular folk. Okay, some of you didn't raise your hand. I don't know what you want me to ask you. If you're weird, you're different, you go by the beat of a different drum, I don't know, you're asleep. Okay, we are, I would say me, I'm a regular folk, 
right? I'm a regular dude trying to live out the mission of Jesus. And this is what the whole gospel movement was built on. Regular folks. Here, let's talk about it. We'll call it the tip of the gospel spear. It has always been ordinary believers. So when we track back to the first century, when the gospel really started to spread, right? We can see three important church planting centers in Alexandria, in Rome, and in Antioch. And what's cool about that, we don't know who started any of the three. In Acts 11, it's a perfect example of this. This is when the word Christian first shows up, and we're still calling ourselves Christians today. So this is our heritage The founding of the church, Acts 11, says some of them, say that with me, some of them, that's their name, okay, men from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. Here's what's crazy about this. The very first, and you can search this up in in Acts 11 there, where the word Christian was used, okay, these men and women, they're just not mentioned in that little phrase, took the gospel to Antioch, and their names weren't even important enough to mention because it wasn't about them. They were regular folks who took the gospel to the Greeks. Pretty cool, right? Now, do we have any movie buffs in here? Anybody watch more movies over the last five months than previous? <laughs> okay, <laughs> so we're all like movie critics now. Okay, most of the time we don't sit through the credits. Right? Unless the movie is so good. If the movie is really good, I'll sit through the credits because I don't want to let that moment go. You know, like at the end of Gladiator, they're playing that music, and I'm just like, I just want to get there in the Coliseum. See, I can't tell if you guys are smiling. Or if you're saying underneath your mask, please stop. Like, <laughs> please. But okay, when you're watching the credits, you know, like way down there, you'll see just, it just starts going real fast. <laughs> and there's just hundreds of people, thousands of people. And then you see some guy's name and you're like, bystander number three, okay? <laughs> That's you. <laughs> That's me, okay? The only person who cares about is that guy who brought his family the one time at the premiere, right? And he's like, check it out. Wait, 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 wait. There it is, you know? And his uncle went to the bathroom, totally missed it. Missed his big moment to see his nephew's name on the screen. But that's us, just regular folks, right? Our names are not important enough to mention in the gospel movement, but the tip of the gospel spear, how it moved in our world, was on the backs of regular folks. Nothing happens unless someone goes. So the big question is this. How can you use your life to fulfill the Great Commission? If you don't know what the Great Commission is, here, let me read it to you, Matthew 28. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. This is when you say, I want to be a Christian, this is what is assigned to you, given to you, okay? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then this is essential, and teaching them to obey, obedience, everything I have commanded you. And that sounds so impossible. And then Jesus says, but I will be with you to the very end of the age. I'm not going to leave you alone in this. And the Holy Spirit is there to guide us as well. So how can you and I use our lives to be that tip of the gospel spear? Let's look at the reality in our world today. There have been, okay, people who have walked away from their faith in Jesus over the last five months. Now, church attendance is not necessarily the only indicator, okay? But churches across our country are showing about 50% showing up. Now, the bigger concern is not who's showing up in person, because we just started meeting in person, right? Or online, because online is totally cool to connect that way, okay? The concern is that about a third, most churches are saying, about a third of the folks that were with them before coronavirus, as far as like engaged in a small group, engaged in accountability, you know, serving in the church, are just MIA, right? Just off the reservation. I mean, just no contact. And let's just say some of those, because I don't know the hearts of everybody, some of those have just said, you know, if they were honest, Jesus isn't thinking of my heart. I'm not going to pursue that any longer. So, guys, we have a mission to accomplish, and we have been given the keys to the kingdom impact, which is Christ. Again, Jesus has the power. We participate. But, man, should we participate in this? How can you use your life? How can I use my life to do this? The first one is got to go. Now, number two is got to go the way Jesus went. Man, there's nothing more frustrating and sad than someone who is going with a bunch of excitement and passion, and they go in the wrong direction, right? 
They get so pumped and they go in the wrong direction. There's groups that use God and they use Jesus for their own personal gain. Scripture speaks of that. And misdirects people. And they've got people who are following this watered down, screwed up version of God and they're going in the wrong direction. So we better figure out if we're going to go, if you're going to go, if you're going to do it, you better go the way Jesus went. So that's number two. Got to go the way Jesus went. Now, if you studied the life of Christ, which as Christians, that should be like, whoa, man, like number one priority, right? Look through the Gospels, look through the epistles, the writings of, of Christ, look through Revelation, see what is going to happen, you know, all that crazy stuff. Look in the Old Testament, see what was prophesied about Jesus. I mean, Jesus is the center figure of the entire 66 books of the Bible, right? So if we study the life of Jesus, what we see is that everything about his life was mission focused. I mean, you don't see in, in, in Scripture Jesus just hanging out and nothing happening, right? I mean, he sat around with his, his closest guys, but there was always like a, a lesson, teaching moment. There was something there with intention. And so if Jesus' life was that intentional, that focused, we can use his life as a model to say if we are to be little Christs, right? Not our power, but his. Like if we're to be Christians, little Christs, then we need to follow the model of Jesus. So I believe it's outlined here really effectively. It's five things. It all ends in T-I-O-N, okay? So hopefully it'll stick a little bit. Here's the life of Jesus in a model form. Incarnation, reputation, conversation, confrontation, and transformation. And as we go through this, I believe it's going to be a lot of fun for you to think, how do I, as a missionary of Jesus Christ, follow this model? I believe it is proven time and time again. The first one, we don't have a lot of time, so we're going to jump in. Incarnation. Incarnation. This means to take on flesh. Okay? God with us. In John 1.14, the message version, which is a paraphrase of the Bible, is best to use alongside the Bible, but it says this. The word became flesh and blood, meaning Jesus took on flesh, just like us. You could touch him. You could listen to him. And he moved into the neighborhood. Oh, I love that. Jesus moved into the neighborhood. See, Jesus didn't serve us from a distance, right? He didn't come in and out. He didn't see the issues with mankind, stay up in the comforts of heaven and say, well, I'll try to make a plan where I can just work with them from a distance. No, he actually came, took on flesh, and moved into the neighborhood to show us a better way. We believe that it is the original way to be human with God at the center of our lives, a better way. My pastor from a few years back, he was preaching a message. I was watching it online, and he was telling a story about a friend of his who always had this saying, this like good old boy saying, wherever you go, there you are. Turn to your neighbor and say, wherever you go, there you are. You got to say it like that, like a country singer. Wherever you go, there you are. And you make there you are one word. There you are. There you are. There you are. <laughs> er. That's it. That's all you. Wherever you are. Wherever you go. Er. All right. All right. Okay, so, so many deep thoughts right there. Wherever you go, there you are. So where are you? Where are you at right now? 9507 East Winter Road, Independence, Missouri, 64053. No, you are in your life, right? Think about your job. How can you fulfill the Great Commission in your job, in your neighborhood, in your family, with the crew that you hang out with, right? Your friends, Facebook, <laughs> social media. How can you be Jesus at the grocery store? while social distancing and wearing a mask and your debit card getting denied <laughs> and forgetting milk at the counter and having to run back. I mean, how can you be Jesus everywhere? That's what Jesus did. He moved into the neighborhood. He came here. So you got to start looking at your environments as you have been sent there. It wasn't haphazard. You have been sent to your current situation. I know it's easy to start to think if you're in crisis mode or something's really hard right now. To think, i got to get this figured out before I could be big for Jesus. You actually might be more impactful now, in a broken moment, in a moment that's very messy, to lean on Jesus and let him do something beautiful with that. Okay, so that's incarnation. The second one is reputation. Now, as soon as I say the word reputation, I always think about high school. I don't know. So what was your reputation in high school? Or for us 90s kids, your rep, <laughs> your straight rep. Now, you don't have to tell me because it might be embarrassing. But like for mine, the reputation that I wanted to portray was I was a drummer 
and drummers are the coolest musicians. <laughs> My sister was a saxophone player. Not cool. Drummer, very cool. Okay. And I was into old classic cars, so we would park over to the side. I had Firebird like it was fun and loud, and I didn't have to have catalytic converters because it was 1974, so just blasting out the glass packs, and it was awesome, and I thought I was super tough. Now, that was the reputation that I thought I was portraying, but if you would ask other people, I cannot get over your mask, Dwayne. I'm sorry. That, can everybody just take a look at this guy right here? He is smiling. It's beautiful. I'm sorry to single you out, but I like in all of the sea of people, like that mask, I can't tell. What's going on back there? You can frown all you want because I think you're smiling. But the reputation that was assigned to me from others might not have been so good. Right? I don't know. Yeah. Think about your reputation. Now, reps are frustrating because they're often assigned to you, right, because you did something or whatever, got stuck in the wrong crew or the right crew or whatever it is, and they're really hard to break, right? I mean, our neighborhood, Western Independence, Northwest Independence, has a reputation across the KC Metro, and we're working hard to change that. It is really hard to change a reputation. But what if, like, just dream with me for a second. What if you could actually build an intentional reputation in the name and power of Jesus with a lesson built in? Because I believe that's what Jesus did. Now, in Matthew 11, Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist who we never see is like, you know, jealous or anything, but he kind of had to wrestle a little bit with it because John was like so cleaned up, you know. Even though he lived out in the wilderness and he was kind of dirty physically, but like he didn't drink, you know, all that stuff. Like he was very, very cleaned up. And then he talks about Jesus' rep. And he says in Matthew eleven nineteen 19, says, The Son of Man came eating and drinking. And they say, Here is a glutton and a drunkard. Glutton means loves food too much. Drunkard means gets drunk on wine, Okay. And he says, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Tax collectors were not honest at that, that time. They had a bad rep. Sinners, known sinners in the community, prostitutes and thieves. This is who Jesus spent time with, enough to actually be called friends with. That was his rep. Luke 19, 10 says this, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So it's very simple when somebody says, why did Jesus come to earth? What would you say? To what? To seek? Yeah, let me ask again. Why did Jesus come? Boy, pretty simple, right? I mean, it really is pretty simple. And we're all lost. None of us came out Christian, okay? You had to make the decision to follow Jesus. You had to recognize as a sinner and say, I want to trust him as Lord and Savior of my life. Follow that with going public in baptism, letting the Holy Spirit live inside of you. I mean, following and being sanctified, which means being changed daily. I mean, this Christian journey is so worth it and is outlined for us. But Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And when I think of that, I think, yeah, we're all lost, so what does Jesus mean? He came to seek and save those who recognize that they are lost. But Jesus' rep was very intentionally built. His reputation played to that goal. And I believe we can develop that as well. You can change your rep. You can change your rep with intentional behavior. If you've got a negative one, you might even be able to use it. I was able to. 10, 15 years after being out of high school, I told you about the good part about what I thought my rep was. I also had a really bad one. And people would say, you're a pastor? You're a Christian? You speak about Jesus in public? That seems like crazy. And I'm like, yeah, there's been a transformation that's happened. And I've been able to speak to that. And it's been really fun. Okay. Third one, conversation. Now, this is a progression. So if you were to build a missionary, wait, we could use this guy. Mr. Grasshopper, okay, if we were to build a missionary, he would be on this um, progression, all right? He would first incarnate, he would move in, be shoulder to shoulder with folks, he'd build an intentional reputation with a goal, and the third one, he would ask questions and be ready to answer, ask good questions and be ready to answer, right? Now, in this conversation, we think about like our neighborhood, let's just use that for a model. You could assign this to your job, your family, you know, wherever, but in your neighborhood, it takes about seven years, they say, I say five to seven years, um, to build a trusting relationship on your block. That's if you're intentional, okay? It takes some time. But I'm talking about deeper level conversations, not just how often do you mow your grass, okay? Or did my leaves get over there in the fall on your lawn? Can I pick those up? But questions like, where do I go when I die? Whoa. Well, that question, there's some relationship built there. There's some trust built there that you will handle that with care. And so conversation comes 
after intentional reputation is built, after they can trust you with that, after incarnation is in place, that they see you as shoulder to shoulder, one of them with them in this. Is this making sense? Can you guys give me a thumbs up? Or I suppose if it doesn't, give me a thumbs up down. Okay, thanks, Dwayne. I know you're smiling. Remember, here's some tip. Here's a tip. You are an ambulance driver, not a surgeon. This is the best Christian advice I've ever been given. Okay. An ambulance driver takes someone who is hurt, tries to keep them alive a little bit, does a little triage. Is that the right word, Christian? No. What would you do in an ambulance? A resuscitate, a little resuscitation? A treat? That treat. Give them a treat. No, that's different. Okay, treat the patient. I would give them a treat. <laughs> you want a power bar? Are you doing okay? Um, no, treat the patient to get them to the hospital where the surgeon is to actually heal them, right? And that's as Christians, we are an ambulance driver to take people to Jesus, right? When someone comes up to me and like, I'd like to talk to you about what's going on in my life, I just tell them, hey, I'm not a therapist. I can't dig into your past, but I can get you to the healer, right? I can get you to Jesus because he's the one that's going to make the difference. And so when it comes up, when the conversation happens, have your hope answer ready. Have your thought ready of how to drive people to Jesus, Tell them what he's done in your life, how he's transformed you. And we'll talk about that in Acts 26, from darkness to light. Okay, and then after conversation is confrontation. Now, there's a great book from Henry Blackaby written in the mid-'80s called Experiencing God. Alongside the Bible, it's my absolute favorite. And it talks about a crisis of belief. Another way to say it is hitting a wall with their worldview or their belief system. Someone who has been doing life their way or in their perception of what's best, and then they just hit a wall. Something doesn't work. Something they were trying to figure out just completely fell apart, and they're con totally struggling. Confrontation. Not necessarily with you, but definitely the flesh versus the spirit. In Galatians 5, it speaks about this, how these two things are in a battle constantly it says, I say to you, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. That sounds a lot like when Jesus says, deny yourself, pick up your cross. Verse 17, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. That's like that confrontation moment, where it's like, well, I've learned a little bit about Jesus. I'm intrigued by this. I want to step foot into life with Christ. And then it's like just this, boom. I can't do whatever I want. I'm not in charge of my own life. I handed over control to a God that I love and trust and will guide me. Real quick thought. This message, the seven for sure, is really kind of getting down to the essentials of who Revive is, really is just the essentials of a Christ follower. Um, Jesus did not die on the cross so that you can take the hope of salvation and sit on it. It was always meant to be shared. That was the intent of it, right? I, I'm not a fisherman. Do we have any fishermen in, in the room? Um, okay, Jesus calls us fishers of men. Now, when I go fishing in a physical sense, I'll throw out my line with a bobber, and the bait, and I'll be with some friends, some are in this room, that throw out the same bobber with the same bait, and will sit, and they'll catch something and I won't. And I hate it. <laughs> and I just want to throw my pole in. And I know why. That fish knows I don't care. <laughs> that fish knows I really don't want to catch it. I'd rather just watch somebody fish than actually catch that fish, right? It's not important to me. Somehow they know, man. They know. <laughs> they know they're going to be handled a certain way. It's the same way with non-believers, with Christians. I mean, with non-Christians, people who are outside of Christ that we're trying to reach. They know if you really care. They know if you really want to reach them and share the hope of Jesus with them. Of course they do. We have that ability as a human to determine if something is fake or authentic, and we want what is real. So do you have a heart to reach people for Jesus? If you do, he will lead you. He will guide you to that truth. And what we're trying to get to is this last part, and I'll read it here in a second. I've got to take a step out of pastor for a moment and just be a dad. 
Um, this last Friday, I got to do like the best thing ever. I got to be a part of my daughter Nora's baptism. Um, we have a, a picture, I hope, because it's like my favorite. That's not it. There it is. Um, so it's my dad, um, father-in-law, and Kristen's um, grandpa. So Nora's great-grandpa, 92-year-old um, man, standing in a swimming pool with Nora. I'm um, getting ready to take her confession. And um, we all shared different things with her about what we see in her. And, uh, you know, I feel like that's my role as a dad, to, to speak truth right into her. This is who you are. This is who you are. Um, Acts 26 is the verse that I shared, and I want to share it with you because it's not only a missionary verse, but it is essential to understand the transformation that can happen in a person's life, all of creation. It says, I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan that has had a grip on them to the power of God, so that they may receive forgiveness of their sins and a place among those who are being sanctified by faith in me. Transformation. That's what we're after. We don't want to see more church goers. We want to see more transformed lives, right? What our neighborhood needs, what our world needs, is dedicated followers of Jesus that get it. We're going to follow him into what's next. So have you been transformed by Jesus? Have you stepped out of darkness and into light? Have you recognized that it's only through his power that you get that journey? Have you like seeing the forgiveness of sins that Jesus offers, that you are no longer held and bound by the sin that has so entangled us. You've been set free. I hope that you make that decision today if you've never made it before. And if not, if you've already made the decision, make it a dedicating day of saying, I want more of Christ in my life. Let's pray. God, I, I pray that my broken words got your message across, God. Fly it into the ears of anybody who's listening through the Holy Spirit, that it would land and make some sense that we've got to go the way Jesus went. And never more important than right now, in, in a time of so much confusion and blaming and anger and all this stuff, and maybe some bad habits seeping in, that we need to follow um, his track, his lead. And so give us clear direction, God. Remind us of forgiveness. Remind us of the cross as we get ready to take communion. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Right now, we're going to do things a little bit different than we normally do them. We're going to head back into worship. So Alex challenged us this morning to do two things. We got to go. And we got to go the way Jesus went. And one way, the only way that we do that, there's so many ways to prepare our hearts, but we have to prepare our hearts in order to go. And one of those ways is through worship. And as we sing songs like the one, the first one that we're going to sing, we are reminded that our God is stronger. Our God is greater. Our God is like no other. And that's how we prepare our hearts because when we truly surrender ourselves in worship, we lay ourselves down and we make God our focus. Would you please stand and sing with us? Water you turned into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the dark
greater our God is in charge of everything he created everything and he makes everything work so it surprised me when I came across in Deuteronomy and maybe you've heard this before to hear that God is jealous for me and so I really couldn't figure out what that meant and so I did a little bit of research read some commentaries and here's what I interpreted God is jealous for us because he loves us. He loves us so much. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. God loves us when he's in charge of so many things that much that he's jealous for our attention. He wants all of our focus, all of our being, Everything that we have should be focused on God. And that's what it means when it says, God is jealous for me. He wants my attention. And so that's what we're going to sing about now.
to accept that into our lives, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and we realize that it's all in love and that's all there is to it, then we know that we want God to be jealous for us. We want to give him our attention. Let's sing that one more time. He is jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. God, we thank you. God, we thank you that you love us so much that you sent your son for us. That it didn't matter if our sin took place in the past or if it's going to take place in the future, that you have already paid the price. Lord, I thank you this morning that you have reminded us that we have got to go and we have got to go the way Jesus went. Those two things go together. You have modeled this throughout Jesus' life. You have modeled this throughout the Bible. And Father, I believe that you have called Revive Church to this. And I thank you. I thank you for anyone here this morning or who's watching this online that has not chosen Jesus, that you would feel the love of Christ in your heart this morning and that you would just drop to your knees like I want to right now and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. And thank you for your commission. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat. This is the time in our worship where we just offer the opportunity to take communion and reflect on the gift that Jesus gave us through his broken body and his blood shed for us. So if you're in the main room with us this morning, you should have an individual cup of communion under your chair that you can grab. If you um, are watching online this morning, you can find whatever you have at home to be able to just take that time. So we invite you just to take a few moments to reflect on the message this morning, reflect on the gift that Jesus has given us.
right, before we head out today, just a reminder, we hope to see you to serve with us next Saturday at CSL. If you need help getting signed up for that, let me know. Um, our kids, they will meet us outside. So if you have kids down in Thrive, as soon as you head out this morning, they will meet you out there to pick them up, all right? I think that is all that we have for you this week. So thank you for joining us for our very first week back together and have a great week.